Good morning and welcome to my weekly look at what's on Twitter, on my Twitter feed. My name is Terry Gorry, I'm a solicitor in Enfield and County Mead and there's a lot of talk in my Twitter feed, obviously not just about law but about the sad passing away of that girl in the UK where she took her own life, Caroline Flack. Um, she was in court or due in court I think um, early March in relation to the alleged assault by her of her partner or boyfriend or whoever. I think he withdrew the complaint when it hit the news first but it's a very sad case obviously. Young woman, I don't know much about her. Uh, don't know where she got her or came from in terms of her uh, fame or what her, her provenance was or her professional background. I think she was on Love Island or something, but that's not a program now that I'd be too familiar with, you know. So Caroline Fleck, very sad. A couple of tweets there about one of them is to do with a Labour Court decision where a former chief executive was awarded 32,300 in unpaid wages. I had a quick look at the case itself. It's in the Irish Times, it was in the Irish Times, and it seemed to be the argument or the position of the company that he didn't actually sign a contract of employment and that he was involved in some sort of a scoping out exercise or some sort of negotiations with the company first and that he wasn't actually an employee. I think that's what they were saying, but clearly that wasn't accepted by the Labour Court, and the Labour Court looked at all of the facts of the situation and uh, looked at the circumstances and decided that he was an employee and that the work that he had carried out, he should be paid for, he was entitled to be paid for. He wasn't volunteering, it wasn't a charity, and he was awarded 32,300 unpaid wages. There's another tweet there from another solicitor about who's an employee and for an employer employee relationship to be in place the employee must be obliged to provide work and the uh, or the employer must be obliged to provide work and the employee must be obliged to accept work assignments and we look at a recent case and so on this is a crucial aspect of the employment relationship and the employment contract the obligation of the employer to provide work and the obligation of the employee to accept the work when it is provided. And this is called the mutuality of obligation. So each party is obliged to do something on foot of the contract. If, for example, the employer has a contract drafted which says, we're not obliged to give you work. And if it also says you're not obliged to take the bloody work when we give it to you, then there's no mutuality of obligation. Neither party has to do anything. In that situation, it's not actually an employer-employee relationship because it is missing the mutuality of obligation that is necessary for a contract of employment to be in place. So that's something to watch out for. And I came across a contract there not too long ago where there was a dispute in the workplace and the actual contract that was written uh, made provision for the occasional tasks or work to be given to the employee but there was no obligation on the employee to do the work when they were asked so there was no obligation on the employer no obligation on the employee and therefore it wasn't actually a contract of employment even though it looked like one and even though the person that I was advising thought it was there's another tweet there now about what's a protected disclosure. There's a lot of misinformation about this. Well, there certainly is. I come across employees all the time who want to talk to me or take some action about a protected disclosure or what they perceive or believe to be a protected disclosure. They have this genuine belief. However, a grievance in the workplace or some practice that the employer or some manager might engage in, which isn't best practice, may not necessarily be, in fact, is almost certainly not to be a protected disclosure because a protected disclosure is set out in the Protected Disclosures Act 2014 and it refers to what is known as relevant wrongdoing. Relevant wrongdoing is essentially a breach of the law, not bad practice by management, not stupid decisions by management. 
not stuff that might cheese you off, make you annoyed, make you frustrated, make you dismayed. That sort of stuff is grievances and grievances are not protected disclosures. So don't go bringing a claim or wanting to bring a claim or going to the WRC or the Labour Court or anywhere else with a protected disclosure claim when all you have is a pile of grievances and complaints. Because you're bound to fail. See a tweet there from the WRC who say that they're delighted to be part of this very exciting nomination for the CIPD Ireland HR Awards uh, for their participation in the Industrial Relations Graduate Programme. Fair play to them, that's fantastic. The whole question of awards though and the whole question of solicitors and lawyers and law firms getting awards and so on is something that I take with a fair degree of sort scepticism I don't think I'll ever be awarded or uh, nominated for an award and quite frankly I couldn't care less my job is to give clarity to the punters to come to me and my job before that is to get the punters to come to me I couldn't give a rat's ass quite frankly about awards or about professional kudos or anything of that nature I'm very very focused on what I want to do and I'm very focused on doing work that matters, doing the stuff that I believe matters. Getting awards, being nominated for awards, in my view, is a lot of baloney. So to anybody who gets awards, to any professional firm who are nominated for awards or win awards, congratulations, fair play to you. But there's just something that doesn't really do anything for me doesn't float my boat um, I have no interest in it and as I say if I'm nominated for awards I don't think I'd bother uh, participating or going along There's an interesting tweet there about a recent High Court case in which centred on the alleged administration of Botox products without a prescription um, the High Court then considered the powers and obligations of authorised officers to conduct interviews under caution and we reviewed the case that's Mason Hayes and Curran that's probably an interesting enough case to look at. I will have a look at that later on. And if there, anything, if there is anything of interest in it, that might be useful to my punters, to my uh, people, uh, the people who sort of watch me uh, on YouTube or read my blog or follow me and that sort of thing. I'll do something about it. I'll have a look at it. Don't know what the story is exactly, but it's an interesting one. And obviously the question of Botox products and so on is sort of a new area of law. Uh, that's probably worth a look and especially when a case ends up in the high court see another tweet there about a cafe being ordered three thousand to, uh, to pay three thousand two hundred euros to a waiter over a dismissal for eating a croissant at work so the waiter i think worked in a coffee shop or something uh, he was dismissed and um, he had been eating a croissant i think his argument or his claim was basically that he was taking some sort of medication and needed something to eat to help with the medication the employer said that there had been issues with the guy up to that and that he had a number of warnings and had spoken to him about, about his performance and so on and so forth it really doesn't make any difference if you as an employer fire somebody without giving them fair procedures and natural justice in other words some sort of a bloody procedure some sort of a disciplinary where you're going to put an allegation to somebody and you're going to give them an opportunity to respond if you don't do that you're going to lose so the cafe was ordered to pay 3200 to the waiter over the dismissal see a tweet there from the bar of ireland and i saw last week there or an earlier tweet a few days ago where the attrition rate the fall off rate or the disappearing appearance rate essentially of barristers who would have qualified say in the last 10 years and many of them are still practicing or working operating as barristers is fairly small in fact the attrition rate could be something like 50 percent don't know exactly can't remember i can't find a tweet at the moment but when i was starting out in law you obviously if you have an interest in law and if you're watching this channel you probably have an interest in law but if you are going into law you can be a solicitor or you can be a barrister this was the decision that I had to face as well when I was starting a few years ago. 
And the huge significant difference for me and perhaps for you will be a solicitor can get punters, clients from the general public. A barrister cannot. A barrister must get instructions from a solicitor. So when I was starting out, I was looking around thinking, who's going to instruct me if I become a barrister? What solicitors do I know? I only know one bloody solicitor at the time, or I only knew one solicitor at the time. That was my own solicitor who I've had for many, many years and still have. But aside from her, uh, I couldn't see how I was going to get sufficient clients if I became a barrister because I wouldn't have sufficient instructions from various uh, solicitors. I didn't have the contacts and so on. And that's one of the reasons why I became a solicitor. And that's one of the reasons that you might consider becoming a solicitor as opposed to a barrister and as opposed to being one of the statistics there of barristers who disappear out of the profession after a relatively short period of time because they find it too difficult. It is difficult because, as I say, the barrister is depending on the solicitor to instruct. And if the barrister does not have contacts or hasn't built up contacts and it's difficult to do that, well, then it's going to be difficult to generate sufficient business to keep going. And the barrister is essentially a sole trader, a self-employed person. So that's something that... Um, Obviously, you need to take into account if you have an interest in becoming a lawyer or in the legal profession or carving out some sort of a career for you in the legal profession. It's a comment there from a law firm. When an employee shows up with their leg in a cast, you know what the accommodations are. But when someone comes in and says, I have severe anxiety or I have stress, it's much harder. That's fair enough. It is difficult to make reasonable accommodation, I suppose, for anybody who would be suffering from some sort of a psychological or psychiatric injury or stress or anxiety or that type of thing. But the law is quite clear. The Employment Equality Act, 1998, I think it is, or 88, 98, makes provision for the uh, employer, puts a positive obligation on the employer to make reasonable accommodation for an employee with a disability. And that disability can be temporary and not necessarily permanent. So that's something employers need to be aware of and uh, need to take into account when they have an employee who has been out sick and a particularly an employee who is indicating or flagging up that they have an issue with their workload or that they're stressed or that they're anxious or that something of a psychological or psychiatric nature is bothering them. But as this tweet says, it's easy enough, I suppose, when somebody comes in with a broken leg or a broken arm, it's easy enough to see exactly what you have to do to accommodate them, whereas psychological injury or stress, it's much more difficult. See, the Law Society of Ireland are tweeting plenty of photographs there of new entrants to the legal profession, new solicitors. Um, the solicitor's profession is, I suppose, an attractive profession for many people. I do know a lot of solicitors that are probably struggling with, and I know a lot of solicitors who are doing very well. So I suppose it's like any profession, there's going to be winners and there's going to be losers. And, you know, it's not a one size fits all situation. You can't generalize and say it's a great industry to be in or a great profession to be in. From a financial perspective, if you love law or if you love trying to help people, if you love trying to ensure people get their rights and get some sort of justice on a daily basis then it's a great profession to be in see a tweet there as well the law society uh, retweeted it it's to do with the legal service regulatory authority is inviting submissions as part of a public consultation on the regulation of advertising of legal services that's interesting because the existing advertising regulations concerning solicitors and how they can advertise and so on is pretty restrictive. Now, I have no difficulty with it myself, quite frankly, uh, no problem whatsoever. But I do recognize that it's a little bit unusual, especially around the whole area of personal injuries, but also around the whole area of no win, no fee, and so on. It seems to be, um, well, just strict regulations concerning it. And um, in invitations from the general public uh, or public as a part of a public consultation is probably useful and it could be interesting to see is there any changes because uh, legal profession is a very conservative profession and in terms of advertising and so on I suppose it does have to 
keep the brakes on to a great extent and uh, not encourage ambulance chasing and that sort of thing. I see a tweet there as well. It's not really a legal tweet, but it is from a solicitor. Um, it's Mike Bloomberg, uh, the guy in the United States, the billionaire who's trying to get the Democratic nomination to take on Donald Trump. It's a good quote, actually. He says, we know many of the same people in New York behind your back, they laugh at you and call you a carnival barking clown. That's in uh, response to Donald Trump. They know you inherited a fortune and squandered it with stupid deals and incompetence. I have the record and the resources to defeat you, and I will. That's a response from Mike Bloomberg to Donald Trump. Um, it's, a, it's a good one. It's a good one to finish this uh, show today on, I think. That's about the height of it for this week. Hope you find it useful. If you do, you might give it a thumbs up down below. And if you have any comments to make, I would be happy enough to see them, all right? And I want to thank you for your likes and your shares and your comments and the growth of this channel. I'm hoping by the end of 2020 or 2020 that I have 10,000 subscribers, but it's unlikely. It's an ambitious, very ambitious target. But I'm at nearly 6,000 now, so I'm hoping to get close enough. Anyway, if you like it, give it a thumbs up down below. And as I say, if you have any comments, leave them down below.